Hi, Purpose Partner. Welcome to another episode of Rise to Your Purpose, a personal and spiritual development podcast for female entrepreneurs with a mission. We are your hosts, Brandy and Natalie. We are founders of Victorious Entrepreneurs Rising, where we guide women to build profitable businesses online through diversifying your income, using kingdom principles in marketing, and operating in a spirit of rest so that you can create kingdom impact. After this episode, be sure to join our Purpose Partner Facebook community and get your copy of our Rise to Your Purpose devotional so we can continue to serve you as we partner together in our faith and business. Let's dive into today's episode. Hey, for friends of Purpose Partners, welcome to another episode of Rise to Your Purpose. I am your host, Brandy Thomas. I'm one of the founders of Victorious Entrepreneurs Rising, along with my sister, Natalie Lawson. And we're on a mission to help you build a profitable online business that works for you while creating kingdom impact and operating in a place of rest. Today, I'm so excited to introduce you to my friend, Tori Hine. Tori is a down-to-earth communicator, coach, and Bible teacher who engages people with her authenticity, wisdom, and passion for God and his word. She is a, the director of strategy for the Freedom Movement, a nonprofit providing trauma-informed coaching from a biblical perspective, and she also runs her own course and group coaching program um, called Work From Worth. I love that Love that name. She helps ambitious women of faith heal the dysfunctional patterns in their story and activate their God-given calling in their personal and professional life. So if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that we are two peas in a pod. We are definitely sisters oh, yeah. with the same heart. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited, Tori, to have you on my podcast. So thank you so much for joining today. Absolutely. And you're right. We are two peas in a pod, my friend. This is, I'm, I'm looking at the outline of what we're going to talk about. And I jokingly said to Brandy before we got started. So do we have like 12 months or do we right. have one hour? <laughs> I know. Because this is, um, we're diving into the deep end, but it sounds like if you've been listening to this podcast, this is where Brandy takes you is yeah. strategy and application and a life centered on the presence of God and yes, I, my main goal is, um, to help women work from a place of worthiness and not for a place of worthiness, um, for the glory of God and for the good of others. I believe transformation happens at the center point and Jesus needs to invade it. So I'm mm -hmm. excited. Amen. Yeah. So for those of you listening, get ready because we are going to be deep diving into self-sabotage and spirit spiritual gifts and really how this impacts our lives and our businesses. Yes. So Tori, let's dive into our first topic, which is fast faith. So the whole, just to like give you guys a little background, Tori did a reel on is fast faith and like versus mm -hmm. flourishing with a steady and secure connection to Jesus. And I was like, we need to talk about this on the podcast and that's going to how yes. we got connected. Um, so Tori, I would love for you to kind of dive into that a little bit more of what that fast faith versus actually flourishing. flourishing. With God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Well, um, one of my favorite, uh, imageries that I offer to people just kind of as a, um, object lesson, so to speak, to speak teacher language, um, is a story of, me in my early twenties, when it came to spiritual formation, I was a young entrepreneur. I actually started as an entrepreneur at the age of 21, shortly after having my son, he was six months old and I opened up an Etsy store where I was making homemade handmade, um, items and Bible covers, custom-made Bible covers. It was not a scalable um, business strategy and I was a one man team. So it didn't last much longer than a couple of years, but it allowed me to um, be home with my son and begin pumping the muscle of entrepreneurship to understand what it would look like mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, grow something on my own um, and use those creative gifts to bring in provision for my family. I have always been a lover of Jesus out the womb. Like I was praising Jesus in utero, you know, um, early on when I was a child, um, even five years old in the playground at school, I would spend my time sitting with people, talking with people, including the people on the outskirts, 
um, loving on the kids that were forgotten and making sure people knew who Jesus was on a deeper level. It's just a part of me. But I also grew up in a um, environment and in a season of church history where we largely focused on behavior modification over heart transformation. Um, I'm 32, so born in the 90s. I'm a 90s baby. And the 90s and the early 2000s um, set the scene for technological advancements. It was the very first onset of the mega church um, format. And suddenly we have all of these curriculums and books and programs and um, every single part of my story, I spent a much more time in a church building than I even did in my own living room or bedroom. Every, uh, every element of our lives, all my friends, um, my extracurricular activities, my, my perception of myself and God was formed within the boundaries of church. Also, what I witnessed in the brokenness of humanity and um, the sin that so very much makes its way within the walls of church and the core woundings in my story, abandonment, betrayal, injustice, um, rejection, all of these things happened within the walls of churches. So it's an interesting thing to navigate. I don't know if there's other people listening to this who are the, um, you know, ambitious woman of faith who their whole worldview was formed within the walls of church. It's a lot harder to name some of the brokenness in your story when it happens within the walls of a church building. And it happens in relationships that are meant to be safe and largely are, but still um, the presence of an enemy that steals and kills and destroys. Now, I only, I say that as like a beginning because I want you to know where I'm coming from when I'm sharing these like two object lessons that describe the difference between fast faith, which is literally what we were fed a diet on as children. (laughs) You know, it's do this, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, Awanas, memorize the things, transform your life, you know, to a shift now in my thirties, um, that really began three years ago at the tail end of my twenties, where I'm understanding there is a better way. Um, so my fast faith, um, I'm an entrepreneur my baby is little. My husband had just got signed with a record deal out of Nashville. So he was traveling, um, for long periods of time. And I was working from home and it was a season of my life where I felt benched by God. I felt forgotten. And the cortisol and adrenaline shots that I was so um, used to getting in my Bible college years and in my, you know, Christian high school uh, and even church environments were suddenly halted. And it was just me, Jesus, and my six month old. And I'm speaking to someone who's listening to this podcast who understands how dysregulating and disorienting that is for people when all they've known of the goodness of God is attached to what is seen by other people. Okay. So all that to say is that in my early twenties, I'm like, you know what? It's time for me to flourish with God. So what I did was I went down to home Depot and I bought one of those really beautiful, um, flower pots, you know, the ones that like hang Mm -hmm. over your, um, over your porch And they're always like elaborate, right? And you look at them and you're like, these are gorgeous. And I'm going to keep this alive for sure. Yes. (laughs) You know, like it costs like 40 bucks or something, you know? So I drop my $40. I come home with this absolutely abundant, beautiful flower arrangement, hang it on my front porch. And I made this agreement with myself, Tori, you are going to wake up in the morning you're going to read your Bible, sip on your coffee. It's going to be this perfectly curated, caffeinated moment with Jesus. And after you have your Bible time reading on your front porch, you're going to uh, water the flowers and we're going to keep the flowers are going to live. You're going to thrive. This is what it looks like, you know? Well, I mean, to my dismay, I go out two days later and my poor little flower pot plant is like, you know, like dying a little bit and like turning brown. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like water. It's not coming back to life. And so I just go, you know what? Um, 
they sold me a diseased flower pot. So I took the flower pot down off of hanging on my like covering. I put it in the car, put my son in the car and I come to the guy at Home Depot and I'm like, hello, sir. I'm taking this back. Um, you sold me a diseased flower pot. I'm going to need another one. <laughs> and he was looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm like, I'm not crazy. Okay. I basically watered this thing. Um, you know, and it wasn't long after that I, I killed that one too, because the reality was, is that, um, that flower pot could only live if it was, if I showed up and I did the work, it was, if it was going to live, it was up to me. And it was a season of life that was so, um, strung dry and, um, the margins were so small that to add something else like watering this plant that would die every six hours without water was very unkind pursuit of what spiritual formation looked like in that season. But I wanted to measure it. I wanted, and when I couldn't measure it or measure up anymore, what was the answer? Fast faith says, you just take it back and you trade it out for a new journal, a new Bible study, a new thing, a new action point. Now, if I fast forward about 10 years later, we now live on a 40 acre property an hour South of Nashville. And the woman who lived here before me lived here for about 50 years, well-established. And when we were buying this property, this little 85 year old woman was walking the boundary lines of the garden and showing me where she planted things. Um, a magnolia tree that's 50 years old now that she remembers growing from seed. Um, where the tulips would come up and proclaim the end of the winter when, you know, she just had stories related to the things that she had grown. And these, this growth had taken time and it was well established. And I remember thinking, it would be really cool to be able to have a peony bush. I had never, I killed everything that I ever tried to grow. And, um, you know, so I had never attempted something like that before and never had the yard to be able to do it. Well, six months later, I walk outside and, I, and there's a new bush that is in my backyard. We're now living in this new house. A couple months later at the beginning of May, these buds open and lo and behold, they're peony flowers. And I had this flashback thinking about my um, hanging flower pot in comparison to these flowers that only show up for six, maybe eight days out of the entire year, but they remain planted. They're up uh, there. Um, flourishing year after year. And when the buds are gone and the beauty fades, you cut that down to its very root system. So you don't even see it and it's preserved in a hidden place. And then lo and behold, in due season, it comes back. And every year it becomes a bigger peony bush with more flowers, more flourishing because it's a plant that remains and the beauty does not hinge on my ability to wake up every morning and make sure that I water it, but it's sustained in a root system that is anchored and abides in a long lasting elements that allow it to grow over time. This is the difference between the trap of fast faith as opposed to a life that flourishes and centralizes itself in Christ. Wow. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> I mean, there's so much to unpack just in that whole thing yeah, that yeah. we just talked about. But yes, like, yes. And that I think is mm -hmm. so, so many of us struggle because we're trying to measure our worth or put our identity in things that are not flourishing or are not sustainable, are not rooted in our true authentic identity, divine identity. Yeah. And we're trying to hold on to things that prove our worth or prove our measure or live our lives based on our results when really we just have to be, we just need to be rooted yeah. to Jesus and Amen. things yes. will flourish and grow that are supposed to flourish and grow. Yeah. Amen to that. Absolutely. Uh, it's so funny. Our journey is very similar. I've been in the entrepreneurial space since I was like 18 
And also in my 30s, I feel like our 20s, I don't know, you're just like figuring stuff out. You are kind of living you in are. the world. You're trying to figure out the world. And then it's like, you're just, you get to the end of your 20s and you're like, the world is done. Like, I want to go back to Jesus. Like Jesus is the ultimate reason Amen. for everything. It didn't satisfy. Just, yeah, yep. exactly. You were chasing these things. And then it's like, and I'm 35. So I was born in 88. So I was also raised in the nineties and yeah, like in my, like I'm 35 and I just wrote a post of like, I just want to rest. I just want to be still and know, like, I just want to focus on where God has me planted right now and not chase after shiny objects or chase after something that's mm-hmm. fast or it's going to like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. maybe give you something that high for a little bit, but it's not sustainable versus just like, Amen. just like digging deeper into the foundation that he has me planted right now and just cultivate that yeah. and grow that and let it, like you said, flourish and grow. Yeah. So, yeah. So awesome. So I know we had a couple other questions in regards to like the fast faith trap versus like the flourishing. And so I mm-hmm. was wondering if you could glean some of your wisdom on like how to gain that clarity and strategy with per- partnering with God and find like, yes. what does that pathway look like to like get to that flourishing and step away from the fast faith? Well, it's interesting because in order for you to have new life, in order for you to experience something new, something has to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually had to choose to let that plant on, so to speak, in a figure of it's a, you know, an imagery or an analogy for something else, but those flowers had to die. Um, there had to be a holy exchange. And so The best pathway of your life in working with God is not an easy ABC one, two, three answer, but one of the um, things that we actually teach in freedom movement and our trauma-informed coaching programs is that you actually need to crawl into the depths of the pain and the brokenness in your story to name the harm and name the wounding and grieve with God and others around that harm, to be able to even have the possibility of a new pathway to work and live in alignment with God's design. And the beautiful thing is that we don't, we don't serve a God that bypasses pain. We serve a God that is very much integrated in it and meets us in it. Uh, remember like the old track visual where you have like, um, you know, you have a little cliff And you're standing on one side, little stick figure on one side, and then you cross over the bridge of, you know, Jesus, and this is sin and death, you know, and then this is new life. In freedom movement, what we teach is like, we don't serve a God who sets the cross at the very top of this, you know, this cavern. But we have a God who, like in Psalm 23 says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not fear. Why? Because you are Mm -hmm. with me. That cross is not set as a type rope over, you know, to type rope over the surface level of the pain and destruction in your story. You actually have a God whose cross is the bridge at the very bottom of this cavern that you found yourself Mm -hmm. in that offers a ladder and the presence of God in the midst of that pain and a ladder to like move out of it and into a new life with him. But something has to die in order to live. And for those of us who grow up in behavior modification, church Christianity, we believe that that happened when we were seven years old. And so we have nothing to complain about and we're just too blessed to be stressed. And yet we're trapped in cycles of behavior mod- of behavior that we want to see change like perfectionism and people pleasing and, um, you know, guarding against intimacy and shaming and um, overworking and um, apathy and procrastination. Uh, these are all quests in our physical body for a place of healing, mm-hmm. a place of calm, a place of rest. And you know, what's interesting. Cause you're, you guys talk about in your intro all from that spirit of rest, right? That we're working with that spirit of rest. Now, here's the thing that you need to hear listeners that are listening to this. 
is that your traps, your behavior that you want to see change, it is the counterfeit offer in your flesh to help create calm for your body, your heart, and your spirit. For, you know, people like Brandy and I, who have been nurtured to do, we have been taught to do, it is very regulating to your nervous system when you finally finish off your checklist, when you reach that next goal, when you've hit that milestone in your business, when you've done the things. And then the problem is that on the other side of that, it starts all over again. And the, and the, um, you know, the next uh, finish line, so to speak, is extended further and further and further. And it's momentary satisfaction, but it is not lasting. And so the cycle starts all over again. What has, in order to find the best pathway to work with God in your life and business, you need to understand where your counterfeit forms of safety are in your story and why you engage them. Because there is a story there that is real and raw and still very much alive in you that needs to be rewritten and grieved with God. And so if you're going to gain clarity and strategy and partnering with God, it's actually inviting him into those places of pain to come and tend with his loving care, to give you another option other than control and safety through what you can control in your behavior. Um, yeah. And on the other side of that, you have the capacity for repentance and repair and forgiveness and partnership with God. Once the damage and the brokenness in your story has been fully grieved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so good. I've just been like thinking about my own trauma and my own stories and mm-hmm. so much of what you listed, I was like, yep. Yep. Like recovering people pleaser. Yeah. Yep. Recovering perfectionist, yeah. like stuck in having to like do the things to feel worthy or, or otherwise I feel disappointed, disappointed or like I didn't meet expectations. Like, ugh, yes. Like you're yes. speaking, I think to so many women who are listening to this, who, yeah. and I'm so grateful for the women, for the leaders that have come into my life and helped me heal through some of those. And like, grieve some of those Mm -hmm. and and also just like on my own journey with God of grieving and like actually allowing myself to be angry with him and have an honest conversation and realize that he is such a good father that he doesn't care that you're I mean he cares that you're angry but like he's not going to be offended when you come to him with your vulnerable broken ticked off Mm -hmm. like one of my most amazing moments in my relationship with with Jesus was like literally if I could put it in a visual it's like black and I'm just like punching his chest like just so mad so angry with all the things in the life of my life that was happening at that time and then it's like you just finally get tired and you just sink into his his arm and like Mm -hmm. finally receive his love and to like understand that he just wanted to be there with me in my anger in my frustration in my grief Mm -hmm. in my sorrow And that builds so much trust, knowing that he's big enough to handle those big emotions. Like that seem big emotions to us, but to him, it's just like my three-year-old toddler who's having a temper tantrum Mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, like let it out. And then let's hug it out after that. Yeah. And because yeah, the the longer that you try to bypass it and bury it, the more it stays alive. And you know what that need of the heart is in its name is that's the, that's the need for containment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you could handle the feelings that I have right now? The, the disappointment, the loss of expectation. Do you know how hard I have worked and the blood and the sweat and the tears to only be left abandoned and rejected and unfulfilled? How dare you? Yes. He can handle this. Um, and yet you named something very, very important, Brandy, in that you couldn't name it on your own. You said, I had mentors who helped me Mm -hmm. process and name it. We become so used to the patterns in our story and what was there that we don't even have the capacity to name these things. Nope. And it's not until somebody crawled into the depths of my story and your story, Brandy, 
to name harm Mm -hmm. that suddenly we realize, oh, there's a story there. I grew up in a Christian home. I didn't think that I had trauma. Right. Um, I wouldn't have ever used that word four years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm too blessed to be stressed, whatever. And yet there was this unrelenting, unfulfillment, dissatisfaction, discontentment in the very, like, you know, the undercurrent of the culture that I was working in was so bred with comparison and shame and Mm -hmm. um, striving that it was like, it was unescapable. And there was this deep root of envy and jealousy in my soul that no external reward or, you know, achievement could uproot. We're going to need something new. We're going to need, um, an encounter with love that casts out the fear that writes these narratives in our story. Yeah. yeah. So powerful. Oh, oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> Do we want to pivot a little bit to like, sure, we can pivot. I mean, I feel like we kind of, I told Brandy, this. I'm like, be ready, yes. Brandy, buckle up. All right, sister, I'm- we're going there. <laughs> I love it. I love deep conversations. Like I am, I just like can't hang. I mean, I can do small talk, but like if we're having, if you meet me, like we're getting into your trauma, like we're going to be diving deep into all the things like we're going. Yeah. I just love to go deep with people. So I'm excited to, for this next pivot in our conversation. So uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was like self-sabotage and like, how do we break that cycle? Cause you mentioned, we've been talking about like self-sabotage with expectation with perfectionism with disappointment with striving like those are all I think kind of the signs of self-sabotage whether we realize it or not like if you're doing those things you're ultimately going to set yourself up for failure because you're never going to be good enough you're never going to meet those expectations you're never going to please that person you know and so like how do we break that cycle oh Well, I mean, we can, we can be at the very surface level for this um, today, but this is what we do in a real deep dive through our trauma informed coaching and through, um, yeah, I, if you want to dive into this on a much deeper level, then please reach out to me and I'll give you resources for it. And, um, we have a really awesome multiple month long program that, really gets this into your bones, but essentially all of your self-sabotage forms boils down to a need for safety. Um, and for perfectionists, they find safety by doing everything right. For people pleasers, they believe that they are safest when other people are happy and secure. If they can control something else outside of them, it satiates and secures that place of safety for the procrastinator. They find safety in urgency. They can't think um, clearly without that cortisol and adrenaline insert. Um, So they wait until the very last moment and they're actually fueled, um, by an avoidance of punishment rather than, um, fueled by a place of abundance. Um, people who have this self-sabotage form of shaming feel safest when things go wrong because joy was used as a weapon against them in their story. And so if they know what to expect, then it's actually feels safer when they're experiencing suffering. I know it sounds crazy to some people, but it's not crazy because our human bodies mm-hmm. were not designed to encounter the brokenness and the pain and the sin that is so very prevalent all around us. We were not designed for this. We were created for goodness. And so with every encounter of harm and pain in our stories, the neural pathways of our minds form in protection against what we fear. So when we're talking about in like first John, when it says perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment, 
this is not something that we now white knuckle and we go, I can't fear at all. And, you know, but really perfectionists are afraid of things unraveling. Um, people pleasers are afraid of doing harm to others. Um, you know, procrastinators are, are afraid of the success really on the other side of what that would mean and the pressure that it would cause. Um, shame is afraid of joy and love because it's been hurtful and damaging in their story. Overworkers find safety in being busy and being productive. I am safest when I'm busy and productive. And so the love of God actually has to come and intend to those places of harm to allow them to have safety with God, even when they're unproductive, even when they aren't busy, even when they're choosing to rest. And I mean, rest for somebody like us who are prone to that overworking tendency is extremely yeah. dysregulating. You choose to rest, you choose to take a day off. And it's why those overworkers are like, I can't go on vacation without my work because they don't feel safe and calm, even in their nervous system. Mm -hmm. If they are still, there's a story there, friend, that's not your design. And so it's interesting because Certain self-sabotage forms culturally for us in America are demonized and others are deified. We live in a culture that loves the overworkers, loves the people pleasers, loves those women that'll kill it for the kingdom, loves those women who will show up early on a Sunday morning at 6 a.m. and not leave church until 6 p.m. until she has to feed her kids and then finally goes to bed at midnight after she's cleaned the entire house and whatever. And that's what she calls Sabbath. They love it. And you know what? someone is benefiting from your self-sabotage and it is not you. It's not you. You're keeping yourself trapped in cycles of behavior modification. When we have a loving, perfect, kind, good, joyful, patient, persevering, you know, generous, kind, loving, heavenly father who invades and disrupts our dysfunctional cycles and offers a way back to connection and love and truth. And what's interesting is that you just said, Brandy, for yourself, you're like, I actually came all the way full circle to be like, turned out, I just want to stand on my own two feet on the ground that God has given to me. I don't need something else external from me mm -hmm. to satiate this internal and, and, and eternal need of my heart. This is where the shift happens is that when love invades the storyline, it's no longer about something external from you that creates safety. It is something that is internal and that internal dwelling of the presence of God cannot be thwarted or shaken or removed. It is secured by the work of Jesus Christ alive in our stories. And we are embodied with the very presence of this love that crawls into the neural pathways of our mind to rewrite the stories of fear with the presence of a loving God. Um, yeah. And I mean, this is so nuanced mm -hmm. that each person has to be able to crawl into the depths of their story, what they learned, what their behavior, because like the root systems of your behavior, there's root systems of belief and experience that fuel that behavior. So everyone comes in going like, tell me the ABC one, two, three, how do I do X, Y, Z? How do I fix myself? How do I change? And the answer is never changing the behavior. The answer is addressing your story, what you be holding your story with God and addressing what you have believed as a byproduct mm -hmm. and how that belief is now showing up in your behavior and it's changing who you are becoming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And our story like that oftentimes creates that gap between us and that relationship with Jesus, which is ultimately the healer that we need to mend that. And we're Amen. creating this bigger gap with our wounds that we're projecting onto our heavenly father. And that's yeah. been part of my story of like being just like, I literally 
this happened to me yesterday. Like I've just been in this, literally everything in my life is kind of falling apart. And Mm. I reached out to a mentor of mine and I'm just like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, you have a spirit of disappointment. I'm like, you're disappointed in God. You're disappointed in your husband. You're disappointed in yourself. You're disappointed. Like, yeah, you named it. Like you said, like I needed her to like name that thing that was like holding me back. And it was like freedom. I needed to go to God to get that freedom. But I was like, I don't even know how to bring us to God. I don't even know what the name was. Once she named that for me, I was able then to start working on that wound that I had with my father that I was separating. I was creating that separation because I had that disappointment between me of like something, that expectation or whatever. And mm-hmm. yeah, like I was sa- sabotaging myself. I was keeping myself from that joy, that peace, that rest that I often talk about because I was projecting this wound that I had onto my heavenly father. And yeah, like, well, that's and it's so let it me come in with a, yeah. with an extra layer of compassion for you, Brandy, mm-hmm. because disappointment, I think is a surface level thing to name. And what is a deeper thing to name is that you actually have a lot that needs to be grieved because you've lost something. You've lost something important to you and you're whatever it is, because I don't know what it is. You're searching for a firm place to land. And so your body goes, go to your husband. It's he can fix it. Go to your business partner. She can fix it grasping, trying to find that place of security again. And so disappointment names something on the surface that goes so much deeper. And then now you go, how familiar is this feeling of Mm -hmm. disappointment? How many times do I encounter this? What have I worked so hard for to only get on the other side of it and not have it be what I expected? Can you hold that with me, Lord? Yeah. Can you help me name that and grieve that? Because you know how that feels at any moment. When we experience something like that, we have two choices. We can either be critical toward ourselves. You're, you're so disappointed. It's a spirit of disappointment, which is, that's not what your friend did to you, but I'm just speaking to someone who might take this and twist it is that I shouldn't be disappointed. Um, And so I'm going to fix it. And, you know, Like, I'm going to start a gratitude journal. No, no, no. What she does with that then is she had to come to a friend to grieve. She has to come now to her husband and grieve and name and invite the love of God in to come and care. So your two options are either critical, which only keeps you trapped in cycles of behavior modification or compassion. Compassion is what it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance and repentance is an invitation back to the party. An invitation is a back to that place of true security that doesn't hinge on something that we can lose. If you can lose it, it's not who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you can lose it, it's not a source of security that is stable and secure and last. But it's from She's frozen. Sorry. Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> okay, we're back. Um, I, I'll finish my thought. We go back there so many times to the familiar patterns in our story where we find safety. And yes. so you being able to name it, Brandy, is victory. Yeah. Because by naming it, then you can invite the love of God mm-hmm. into it. And then it doesn't have to write the narrative of your story yeah. from there. Hallelujah. That's yes. what freedom looks yes. like. Amen. Amen to that. Do you want to dive into our last point? Or do you- <laughs> well, you can, and I'm just going to give a very brief, okay. um, a very brief overview. Okay. So our last point that we're going to talk about was how do we operate from our spiritual gifts and what does that actually look like? Yeah. So on the other side of grieving your story and inviting the love of God in, you pull back those layers of, um, counterfeit ways that we find purpose and worth. And then, um, the Lord 
brings you back to who you always were. Um, and I mean, scripture speaks to 21. Some people say even more spiritual gifts that are the activation of God alive in your story. Um, and you know, we won't go into all of them and what they are, but it is so important that you know, the nuances of these gifts, because for a long time, I thought I was one gift when I realized that it, I actually had strengths in other giftings. So there's sometimes you can find that like the gifts and the values that you protect in your story are not yours, but someone else's that were projected onto you. And so in this process of healing with God and knowing the ways that you find traps in your spiritual, in your self-sabotage, those traps actually are also um, highlighters for whatever your gifting is and what your calling is. Um, because wherever the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy is an area that's highlighted by the Holy spirit of a place that you're meant to be used. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's interesting because we think what disqualifies us or what traps us is always going to be there, but it's actually the refiner's fire that helps clarify for us exactly how we're meant to be used by God. And so working from your worth means you're now working in alignment with these values, with these giftings, with your season and empowered with the centralizing presence of the goodness of God alive through everything that you do. And this now is no longer contingent on the outcome, but it is the very process of becoming who you always were, um, with God and becoming more like him who already dwells within you. Mm -hmm. The truth is, is that like everything else in your life, you will lose. Um, when you first encounter someone, I'm encountering you today, Brandy, and I know you're a communicator. I know you're a strategist. I know that you're a coach. I know that you are a servant. These are all things that you do. If I go in a layer deeper, I know nothing about what your house looks like, what your husband looks like, what your children look like, you know, if you have children, all these things, you know, I don't know the, the nuances of the intimate place that other people in your intimate circle will be there. And that's like one layer in on your identity and calling external from what you do is really like who you are and the roles that you play wife, um, you know, uh, business owner, mother. And these are the people that next layer in intimacy. Those are probably the people that'll be at your deathbed, you know, your family, yeah. the people on the outskirts, they're not going to be in your deathbed. They might show up at your funeral, but they're not going to be at your deathbed. One layer in deeper is your deathbed. One layer deeper is your actual body heart, soul, mind, physical body, will. This is a deeper layer of your identity. And then the very center point is a redeemed soul that is the only thing that you bring with you from this life to the next. Mm -hmm. And so when your, your spiritual gifts are activated, that's still just the outskirts of who you are, because you could lose your limbs. You could lose your ability to speak. You could lose your family members. You will lose certain family members. You can lose your house. You can lose provision. You can lose your physical body. You can lose your, you know, mental stability. You can eventually with your last breath, you will lose your spirit mm -hmm. and you will be left with this soul that you have grown and nurtured with God that carries from this side of heaven into eternity. A working in alignment with your spiritual gifting and values and boundaries and everything is so important. And um, again, just hitting the like the foundational like surface level, but deeper than that is the soul that you are nurturing with God that has nothing to do, uh, does not does not have as much to do with what you do for God, but who you are becoming with Him, and that's the that's the center point of what. Um, keeps us from the trap of fast faith and allows us to flourish with God for eternity and every moment until we arrive there. Mm. So beautiful. I could listen to you. We could probably talk for another hour or so. 
thank you so much, Tori, for just diving into that. And I know we did really just scratch the surface on a lot of these topics. Yeah. Um, and so I definitely want to encourage anybody listening who is, you know, I mean, she almost had me crying at one point. So like, if you're feeling like mm. a move, movement in your spirit and your soul, like reach out to Tori, I'm going to put her Instagram handle. Do you have a website or anything for the, um, your program yes. that I can drop to? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, um, you can go to www.torimayhine.com. That's my personal website. And if you want, um, there's information there on a course that I have, but there's also information on live workshops that me and the founder of Freedom Movement are doing together. Her name is Carrie Garcia. Um, if you are an ambitious woman of faith and the things that I talked about today, you're like that. I need that on a much deeper level. Um, we were your girls. Um, we want to help you live free and fully alive in your gifting and in your story. Um, we're not your girls as much, at least in our programs for strategy and implementation or website building or whatever, but we're about your soul. And, um, then you have other tools like Brandy and other things of being able to implement that soul healing into what you actually do in your day to day. So yeah, torimayhine.com. You can access my podcast there, my course and our live event workshops. And we run two, three month um, mentorship programs each year that coincide with some of the things that we're doing in freedom movement physically. Um, so it's a very embodied experience, but our freedom movement website is www.wearefm.org. And you can learn all about our, our coaching events, our certifications and, um, online membership there. So awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tori, for taking the time out to meet with me today and to be on our podcast. Uh, this was just an amazing conversation and I'm so glad that we were connected. Thank you so much, Brandy. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Tori. If you'd like to partner with her further, you can join Tori for a free live workshop that she's hosting called Work From Worth Virtual Workshop, and it's going to be a two-day event, August 18th and 19th. If you would like to know more information on how to register for this, you can message her, message her at Tori May Hine on Instagram or check out her website. All of those details will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. We would love to hear from you. So please share your takeaways by tagging at live victorious over on Instagram and leave a review. This will help us get more visibility and reach more women like you for the kingdom. We appreciate you and are praying for you as you shine your light in the business world and rise to your purpose.